Um, we were delighted to find out that we had a professor here on campus at GW who was interested in this stuff as much as we were. And uh, we're delighted to have Rebecca Thesson, who's currently an assistant professor for educational administration here at GW. She's in uh, GSHED at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. We call that GSHED around here. So if you hear that term bantied about, you'll know why. She conducts research in the areas of instructional leadership, professional learning, and school and district improvement. Prior to coming to GW, she was the Chief School Improvement Officer for Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, while in Montgomery County, Rebecca coached principals and designed um, professional learning for administrators focused on school improvement and closing achievement gaps. As a Montgomery County parent, I'm going to have to thank both Rebecca and Irina, who's also from Montgomery County, for their hard work, so thank you. Um, she holds a doctorate in urban superintendency from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. That's a little school up north. You might have heard of it. Next to her is Irina Lagrange. Um, I think from now on you're going to be known as the Data Ninja. Thank you, Mark, for that term. I love it. Um, she is um, a principal who has worked closely with Rebecca, and she's a principal of Tilden Middle School in Montgomery County. Um, she's a, a current doctoral student in educational administration and policy studies here at GW, and she started her journey in education with Teach for America 18 years ago and has been an English teacher at both the middle and high school levels. And then finally, Elliot Asp, who joins us from Colorado. He's special assistant to the commissioner of the Colorado Department of Education. Elliot has been a classroom teacher in both traditional and alternative settings, a curriculum developer, a university professor, and an administrator at the building and the district level. So he's going to have a whole lot to talk about on this panel. Before joining the department, he was an assistant superintendent in Douglas County and Cherry uh, Creek School Districts and had held central office positions in Littleton and Aurora Public Schools. So uh, we have the makings for a great discussion here, but to start us off, Rebecca is going to tick through um, some of her slides on some of the research that she's done on this issue. Good? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning to join our conversation on teachers' use of data. As we've heard so far today, um, states and districts are doing a great job providing with teachers with increased use and access to data. But we've also heard how, um, for the most part, if you're a K through 12 educator, you probably feel more as though you're drowning in data rather than you want more data. In, in having all of this data, many of our schools and districts are really struggling with how to use data effectively to improve instruction. Unfortunately, analyzing student achievement data by itself will not improve schools. Many schools and districts have given teachers time to use data in PLCs to provide them with access and available time, resources, and collaboration to be able to learn how to use data together. However, in many cases, principals, school leaders, and teachers then analyze data over and over again, not quite knowing how to move from data to action. Um, I call this analysis paralysis, not knowing how to move forward to actually use data effectively. We heard from Mark, he talked about moving from information to insight. This is a very difficult thing to do. I've also seen that many schools and districts actually use data by determining how to provide more to students who need it, our students with the greatest needs. Um, that more often takes the form of interventions, out of school tutoring programs, additional support during advising periods. However, that's only one part of a school's improvement plan is providing more to the students who need it. We also need to be thinking about how to facilitate instructional improvement for those students in the classroom and for all of our students. We need to move beyond making structural changes to actually making instructional changes to benefit all of our learners. The systematic collection and analysis of both teacher and student evidence is something that I've found is essential as both a researcher and a practitioner to be able to facilitate instructional changes in the classroom. I use the term evidence as opposed to the term information because information I think of as one point of data or one point of information over time. Um, but evidence as opposed to, to data, and I apologize, I reverse those words a little bit. Evidence I think of as something that helps you to gain greater clarity and greater understanding, greater detail of what's actually working as you move forward to make those instructional changes. So it helps you to understand that particular challenge or strategy you're working on, whereas data can sometimes be seen as being one piece of information at one point. So how does a school begin this very challenging work of using evidence to facilitate instructional improvement and moving away from just structural changes to instructional changes. 
I've found that there are four things that school leaders need to do in support, with the support of central office to be able to make this change. The first is to identify a clear instructional goal. We heard from Brennan this morning that the most important data is our student data. Um, that student-centered da data is our most critical piece of information. That is where this work starts, determining which of our students are not being served well and have the greatest needs. Asking the question, who needs uh, more, better, who needs instruction to be different? In order to do that, you have to review multiple types of both teacher and student data to be able to understand and identify that learner-centered problem. If you've read DataWise by Boudet City and Murnane, they talk about this area of student need as the learner-centered problem. Then you take that learner-centered problem and you write an instructional goal. What will the entire school do to make progress to address the needs of the students with the greatest need, but also to improve instruction overall for all students in the school. The instructional goal should not only meet the needs of students who need more and um, above what other students need, but they should, it should also meet the needs of all students and therefore meet the school's goals of providing certain knowledge and skills to all of their learners. Because writing and meeting an instructional goal takes an incredible amount of learning. Professional learning for both teachers and leaders is a key part of this work. The instructional goal then articulates what all teachers will do differently in the classroom in order to facilitate student learning in a specific way. The second thing you need to do is you need to facilitate a school-wide cycle of improvement. Schools and central office team members together need to draft a very clear action plan that will facilitate um, what not only the school leader, but members of the leadership team, teachers, parents, partners, um, central office team members will do to help move the school forward to meet their instructional goal. At a very basic level, the four components of that school improvement plan should, um, should be guided by plan, do, study, act cycle. So at the first stage, plan, okay, what is our instructional goal? What are we going to do differently? And what evidence are we using to actually understand what we should do differently to change instruction? When you get to do, you're making that change in instruction. You've learned what you needed to to understand how the change is going to look differently in the classroom. And then you're facilitating that instructional change. During the study phase, you're looking at the evidence to determine, did we actually make a difference? Looking at both teacher and student practice evidence. And then in the final um, section of the cycle, teachers and leaders are refining that instructional goal to determine, well, did we use the right strategy? Do we need to make a change? Did we, did we actually get, get at what, where we were trying to see improvement? And if not, what tweak do we need to make? If we achieved our goal, then what's the next level? How do we push our students to that next level of learning so that we can continue seeing improvements over time? It's a, through this continual cycle that improvement can be sustained not only over the course of one semester or one year, but over multiple years at a school site. Third, it's critical to collect and analyze evidence from both adult practice and from student learning. And you, you need to use multiple types of evidence in order to understand if teachers' understanding of a specific concept has led to increased student learning. If you don't gather evidence of adult practice to determine the effects of adult actions, you won't know if the student results you're seeing have actually resulted from the adult actions that have taken place. You can't tie the two together unless you have hard information and evidence of what actually changed in the classroom. So what did adults do differently? As part of this, you also need to consider how those students of greatest need are progressing. So you began the process of leading instructional improvement by determining um, who are our students of greatest need? Go back to them. Are they actually engaged in the classroom when you observe them? Are they actually showing that they mastered the skill that you use the new instructional strategy to help them address? And it's also important to remember to utilize evidence from leaders, from teachers, and from students at each part of the cycle to shorten that evidence to action trajectory. Often we think about um, writing your school improvement plan at the beginning of the year based on your new state test results, however, that school improvement plan is probably going to sit on the shelf as opposed to be used over time if it's just based on that source of data as the primary source of data. So how do we actually utilize evidence over the course of the entire year to learn how to make changes between one week and the next in our instructional practice and not wait again until that next um, assessment result comes from the state? 
Finally, the importance of a strong leadership team to lead this work. One school leader can't do this work alone. Leading uh, leaders at grade levels and departments need to be prepared to lead their teams as professional learning communities so this work can be engaged in across a school. To ensure progress, all of the PLCs need to have an aligned purpose that's tied to both school and district improvement results. They all need to be moving in the same direction, working on the plan phase, working on the do, the implementation phase, then studying. Did we actually see a difference? Did it, did it change what students are learning in the classroom and then moving to study? How do we all move forward in the same direction? In order to do this work, your school leaders, department leaders, team leaders, all need to be prepared to facilitate learning and to lead this cycle. And research and evidence and my own practice show that when PLCs um, will work, when they, they will facilitate achievement of student progress, when they're actually provided with the supports that they need by school administrators to be able to be successful. So one last point I just want to make is the critical role of central office in this work. A central office needs to prioritize development of principals instructional leadership in order to lead the school improvement process. Okay, just as, um, as a student, you don't know how to write a full paragraph the first time you're asked to do it, neither does a teacher know how to use data effectively or a school leader know how to lead this process. How do we provide our leaders and our teachers with knowledge and learning to be able to know how to use evidence effectively to lead an ongoing process of improvement? and central office members should really partner with and coach school principals in how to design a clear action plan that articulates their roles as well as the role of the principal, as well as the roles of teachers and school partners um, that each one of them will take to facilitate improvement. So using evidence as part of a systematic process of instructional improvement, it's one of the most difficult tasks that our school leaders face. Um, but with the support of central office and with the learning needed, to facilitate this work by our school leaders. I've seen in practice the effects that it can have on our students and all of our learners. Thank you.